Welcome to London First Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here. We are also glad that there's some nice weather today, right? Yeah. We've had a couple of people in our church already go out to Mississippi, and now they're back going to places in Arkansas because of what's happened recently. So we'll be praying for them for sure. Um, we're thankful that God uses Arkansas Baptist Disaster Relief all over the place, but even in our own state, uh, which we need right now. So we're grateful for that. Also, I know it'll be mentioned later, but there are still several slots left for the Friday prayer stuff. Um, we're trying to do a 12-hour, 30-minute-at-a-time prayer thing on Good Friday. Uh, we still could use several people to sign up on that as well. So keep that in mind as you go through this morning. Call to worship comes from Psalm 118. Let's stand as we read from God's Word. Open the gates of righteousness for me. I will enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the Lord's gate. The righteous will enter through it. I will give thanks to you because you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came from the Lord. It is wondrous in our sight. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let's start on that chorus. Let's start on the Yeah. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Blessed assurance. Savior all the day long. 
Hope you guys are having a good morning. You guys have already had a chance to do some Bible study in the core this morning about 9.30. You know, many of you saw get some coffee and get into Bible study. And uh, this is all, this is all, y'all can hear me, right? Cool. And uh, just want to make sure, what I could tell, I wouldn't, some of you guys are up late last night, I could tell. Um, but no, it, it is good to be here this morning. So grateful to be here. There's just very few places, if any, I'd rather be on a Sunday morning than with, with you guys worshiping the Lord together and, and just uh, fellowshipping and having a good time. As we uh, pray this morning, uh, we're going to let the Scripture guide us in a few moments, but obviously we have some things we want to be praying for. Not only in the last uh, week, week and a half, have we seen tornadoes uh, really blister Mississippi, but of course, uh, just in our own neighborhood 48 hours ago, we saw what the tornadoes did in Little Rock and Jacksonville and Wynn. And, and so... Uh, I, I'm still amazed. I, I know that we did see some fatalities here in Arkansas, but I'm still amazed that we saw all the destruction we saw in Little Rock and, and so few fatalities, uh, something to be thankful for uh, there. And I know that uh, uh, Steve and Tammy Chandler, as well as Jim, were uh, in Mississippi for some time this past week with Arkansas Disaster Relief, but they've all been recalled, and they're perhaps, I know Jim's going to win this afternoon, Jim. Uh, to work there, and, and uh, so there may be some uh, some time, even Steve and Tammy may be going to, to, I think that's still up in the air, perhaps. Going to Little Rock? Okay. So um, obviously all kinds of needs. So we want to be praying for our own state, our own fellow residents here in Arkansas, as uh, they have, so many have lost their homes and lost so many things over the past several days. So we'll be praying for that. But uh, also we want to be praying for our, our one. We have one more week. You know, uh, three weeks ago, we started uh, four weeks of praying for uh, an individual that we know does not know the Lord and to pray for them each and every day between that Sunday three weeks ago and this coming weekend. So we want to continue to do that as well this morning. So we're going to let that, all these things guide our prayer this morning. We're going to read first, before we do that, out of John chapter 12. And we'll let this guide our prayer this morning. John chapter 12, the first 11 verses. Six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Uh, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? He said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had been 
And he, and he had the money box. He used to pilfer what was put into it. Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. I've always found those last couple of verses to be remarkable, that there were those who saw Lazarus raised from the dead, saw Jesus as the one who raised him from the dead, and instead of responding with faith in Jesus, went, we got to kill that guy. They like him too much. Meanwhile, I want to be, I, I want to be, um, I want to be Mary, I want to be Mary and Martha. I want to be the one worshiping Jesus. And so as we pray this morning, we're praying that those to whom we have been praying for would come to faith, would come to adore and marvel at the resurrection that Jesus provides and that our lives would point them to them. So our prayers this week might be not only for the one we're praying for, but also that this week of all weeks, God might give us those opportunities to share and to invite them to, to the gospel. So would you join with me in bowing in prayer? And would you begin this morning by thanking him for the eternal life that God has provided for you? Would you praise him for the resurrection that will one day be yours? Would you ask the Lord this morning for a heart that adores him and is devoted to him just like Mary was? Pray that your love for Christ would grow each day. Would you pray that your one this morning would be drawn to Jesus just as the crowds were in John chapter 12. Pray that the eternal life found in Christ would become clear to them. Would you pray that any opposition to the work of God in the lives of those you're praying for, pray that Satan's work would be defeated they would see the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection. Would you, play that the re would you pray that the resurrection life found in Christ would be evident to those in Little Rock and in Wynn and in places like Mississippi who are seeing so much destruction. Pray that God's people would be effective in showing the resurrection of Christ. Heavenly Father, this morning we are as your people so grateful for the eternal life that's been made ours through the work and the death of Christ. For we praise you and acknowledge that there is no other who can do what you have done. You alone are God. You are alone are the God of creation. You are the God of resurrection and the God of life. And we look forward to that day when we will be resurrected with Christ and have eternal life. Lord, I pray that this coming week we would be those who would not reject the work of Jesus, but would in fact adore him and worship him with all that we are. Lord, may we be a people this week who would be as devoted to you as Mary was in John chapter 12. Lord, would you grow and, and strengthen our love for you each and every day this week. And Father, would our love for you would the would the power of your resurrection be so evident in our lives these next few days that those who do not know you would be drawn to you? Would the reality of your, of your current life be so real that even the ones we've been praying for this week would be drawn to you? Lord, would you defeat the plans of the enemy 
to keep those who do not know you away. Well, we, the, the ones we've been praying for for these last several weeks, would you work in these next several days that they would see clearly the truth of what Jesus said, who Jesus is, and what he has done. And Father, we pray the exact same thing, not just for those for whom we've been praying for by name the last three weeks, but we pray that for all those who have been affected by the storms, the tornadoes, especially in our own home here in Arkansas. Lord, some 2,100 homes, I think, in Little Rock alone were damaged or destroyed in addition to all those affected in places like Wynn. Father, may people find shelter in you. May your people work to provide relief and, and love and meet needs in such a way that the gospel is made known and that as we approach Easter, there will be those who come to new birth and new life as a result of this week. Father, may even right here in London, May your people this week live in such a way that the power of the resurrection is displayed. Lord, may through our praying on Friday, may through our services and things on Wednesday night, may through the Easter egg celebration on Saturday, may through the services next Sunday, may you be made so clear and so evident that people are drawn to the risen and living Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, our gospel moment today is Hebrews eleven thirteen through 16. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared them for a city. I was looking at our next song. It's copied out of a hymn book I uh, got from my granny, uh, and she liked to put biographies of the people that wrote things in the margins. And so this is uh, by Luther Bridgers. And the song it says, Bridgers' wife and three sons died in a fire when he was 26. And he wrote this song, Word Than Music, just a few months later. The song is, He Keeps Me Singing. Despite the, the tragedy that he felt and he went through, putting his mind on Christ, and like Flynn said, keeping his mind set on, on the good things, it allowed him to praise Christ even in tough times. So would you stand as we sing together here? There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not I am with thee, peace be still, in a love my heaven and flow, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every love. 
are this morning in Exodus chapter 13. You know, everyone loves a, a bit of a comeback story. This is uh, some, March now leading to April Hill is, is one of my favorite times of the year. And not only do I love spring and the end of winter, I enjoy what is especially called by many March Madness. You see double-A basketball tournament. Now I I enjoy it to watch the games, the comebacks, the, 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 the people, the teams that nobody's ever heard of before, the guys who are whatever. I, I enjoy the stories and I enjoy the games. And I know it's not because I'm very good at picking the bracket out. We have a, we have a little fun competition. Nothing, there's no betting involved, but we have a little competition as a staff. We, we, something, we pick out brackets. And I've got a streak going for five or six straight years 
I have finished in, well, last place. Even though I think, was Andrew last place this time? He's so grateful I put that, I pointed that out. And, and, and no offense, and, you know, you know, I follow basketball a bit, and I pick logically. And man, it was bad this year. I got nothing right. I, I enjoy the stories, though. I, I enjoy the comebacks. I enjoy the, the, the difficulties. It's, it's, I enjoy the stories when someone gets knocked down, when they've suffered pain, when they've gone through it, when they've been defeated, and then through determination, they work their way back. Sometimes we call those redemption stories. They're great and they're inspirational. We like stories of overcoming and turning defeat into victory. We like comebacks against the odds. But let me suggest this morning that as we come to Exodus chapter 13, the word comeback or comeback stories, inspirational stories, and redemption stories aren't necessarily the same thing. The way sometimes that we use redemption in our modern terms is not really quite what the Bible means by redemption. When we come to Exodus 13, redemption is at its most basic the idea of someone who has been ransomed, someone who has been purchased and restored. The truth is the, the closest thing to a, a modern equivalent would be someone who's been kidnapped and has been bought back. That's actually probably a more biblical understanding of the word redemption someone who has been at great risk and resources of someone a sacrifice of someone else has been made or has been brought back to where they were for example the story of ruth which we were looking at at this time last year where you have someone called the kinsman redeemer boaz in that particular story who at great personal sacrifice put out his resources so that ruth and that naomi could be restored to a, a position of security and stability within the community and within the family, to no longer be forced to live on the fringes or as an outcast or as beggars. It requires the Redeemer to, at great personal sacrifice, put the needs of another, in this case a relative, ahead of his own, and with very little, if any, expectation of recovering those resources. It was a thing of great cost for a Redeemer to pay the price to bring someone or to restore someone back to standing. Redemption is something done for someone else, at least in biblical terms. Now, we began looking last week at the Passover, that time and place when God, through uh, the plagues and ultimately through the Passover itself, the death of the firstborn of Egypt, redeemed and rescued and restored Israel as a nation. We saw last time the conditions and the way that God had given the people of Israel to observe the Passover, all the, all the different rules and regulations. And Passover was at one time, or is it once, it's two different things. It is at one, the immediate night, that night when Israel was freed from oppression and slavery in Egypt. So when we talk about Passover, we talk about that one singular evening when the firstborn of Egypt were were destroyed when the Israelites put the blood over the mantles and when they were rescued from their slavery. There is that one instance, that one night, never to be repeated. But then there was the festival, the feast of Passover and the festival of unleavened bread that God instituted that would be a yearly annual reminder of that one night. So there were two things that were happening. There was the individual event itself, and then there was the remembrance that would gall everyone's attention back to that one night that changed everything. For in that one night, every other night finds its meaning. Without Passover, the event, there is no nation, there is no people, there is no freedom for Israel. And we saw in the Passover that God's purpose in that, and in fact all the ten plagues as we come to call them, that God's purpose in that was to display his glory, his character, and his purposes, not only to Egypt, but to Israel as well. To identify who he is. The remembrance that God established, the festival, the feast and the festival that would have followed for years were to remind God's people about what he had done and who they were. 
We saw all that to some degree to certain last week. Now, as we come to chapter 13, and I realize we're actually going through the story fairly quickly, what Passover does is the marking that night is that the blood of the Passover lamb was uh, to demonstrate the cost of God's redemption. That Israel would be purchased and redeemed, and the cost of Israel's freedom was, in fact, the firstborn lambs, and even in their case, the firstborn of Egypt. Let's read chapter 13. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast. It belongs to me. Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, near the, from the house of slavery? For by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out from this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. On this day in the month of Abib you are about to go forth, and it shall be when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall observe this right in this month. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all your borders. You shall tell your son on, the, on that day, saying, It's because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And this shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you shall keep the ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. Now, when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers, and he gives it to you, you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. But every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? You shall say to him, with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So it shall be, so it shall serve as a sign on your forehand, as a phylactery on your forehead, for with a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. We're going to pause there. Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning to have a copy of your word in front of us. And we're grateful for the opportunity to read it and to know it and to seek to understand it. And Father, as we read about what you did in the life of Israel so long ago, I pray that you would make clear to us what it is you are doing even today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The end of chapter 12 and here in chapter 13 details to us what took place that singular night so long ago in Egypt? It also details the circumstances. If we were to go back to read the end of chapter 12, we would find that as Israel left Egypt, not only did they get their freedom, but they plundered Egypt in the sense that they left with riches. It says that God gave the Egyptians, one, a fear of Israel and also a, a, a favor so that all the all Israelites had to do was ask their neighbors, their Egyptian uh, neighbors, for for riches, and they gave it to them. And so it says that when Israel left Egypt, that Israel gave, that Egypt gave them all kinds of gold and silver. So all these things are true, and so Israel has left Egypt under these circumstances. They were brought out by God's powerful hand in miraculous ways. And this passage tells us not only they're to, to celebrate this, but they're to do so in such a way that they pass on from generation to generation all that God did they were redeemed and as they pass this on from generation to generation israel's identity is to be that of a redeemed people israel was not to be known for escaping egypt because of their great military strategy israel was not freed from egypt because of their revolutionary activities they, they weren't terrorists they didn't rise up militarily they didn't scheme their way out of it israel found their freedom through no act of their own they found their freedom because of the sacrificial work the redemptive work of god 
And Israel's identity from that day forward, whether they're wandering around in the wilderness or whether they are in, in the promised land, is to be a people who exist simply because God redeemed them. And so one thing that's happening here in chapter 13 is that God is establishing not just the events that gave Israel their freedom, but their annual reminders, and he's given them things in their society that will remind them and point others around them to this truth. Israel belongs to its Redeemer, God and God alone. The permanence of the nature of the Passover festival was to color and shape all of Israel's calendar, their lives, but also their identity. A redeemed people. That in every circumstance and every day, they operate from this point of view. We are here because we were redeemed. And so what we see in chapter 13 is God's way of reinforcing that. I want us to be reminded of a couple of things. If we were to read earlier in Exodus what we have done the last couple of months. Chapter 1 of Exodus, we find that Pharaoh commands that all the firstborn or the, all the male children of Israel are to be drowned in the Nile River. In chapter 5, God calls Israel. In chapter 5, verse 22, this is what God says. Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. This is what God is saying to Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 13, he says, When Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt. The firstborn of Egypt was a part of God's redemption for his firstborn, the nation of Israel. That's a, a hard thing for us to look at and wonder why did God do it this way, but he did. And remember, Egypt started it, so to speak. Pharaoh went after Israel. He went after God, and he went after God's people, and God said, I'm not going to let that stand. I'm going to redeem my people, and here's going to be the way it is done. But even more than that, we see in chapter 13 here that God tells Israel, his people, that they also have to commit their firstborn to the Lord. The truth is, it wasn't just the firstborn of Egypt, the firstborn of Israel were also involved in the redemption of the people of God. And we're going to look at this a little bit. Chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, it says, sanctify to me. You might hear the words set apart. You might hear the words devote. But either way, the point is this. God says to Israel, you are to take your firstborn male sons, and they now are to belong to me. They're no longer yours. They are mine. Now, this might call to mind other instances in Scripture. For example, for example, you may remember Samuel's mother. Her name was Hannah. And she told God, if you will simply give me a son, I will sanctify, set apart, devote him to you. I will give him to you. You remember the story? She, of course, did that when he was young. He goes to serve the Lord and work with Eli there in the tabernacle. You may think of Samson's parents doing something somewhat similar. The idea is to set someone apart for service, a unique dedication to the Lord. And every time in Israel, following the Exodus, every time they had a firstborn male son, they were to, in a similar way, dedicate, submit that young man, that child, to the Lord as a unique, uh, in a unique way, belonging to the Lord and not so much to themselves anymore to remind them of the cost of their, of, of their freedom. Now, in verse later on that chapter, in verse uh, uh, 14 and 15, it talks about that, the, I'm sorry, the end of verse 13, it says, your firstborn among you shall be redeemed. Now, what's, what's happening here? Well, they are to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a lamb. So what's happening is this. Not only would Israel once a year at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Passover celebration, be reminded through the celebration of the Passover feast that they exist as a people only because they are redeemed by the work of God. Every time there is a firstborn male son born in that culture, that child is at once dedicated to the Lord, given to his service, and then redeemed by the sacrifice of a lamb. So you can see how God is reminding Israel in their daily life, and in their annual calendar, you are a people who exist 
because I redeemed you. And you're going to see this picture through Passover. You're going, to see, you're going to see this picture when you have to redeem your own sons through the sacrifice of a lamb. Now, he even, there's, there's, even a further, uh, there's even a further example of this. He talks about the donkey. And I don't know about you. I went, what do donkeys have to do with it? <laughs> where, where does the donkey come out of this? Well, the donkey was the one somewhat you might call livestock, domesticated animal that Israel would have had access to and been part of their daily lives that was considered to be an unclean animal. You know, sheep and goat and cattle, all these things were, were clean. You could eat those. You could eat a donkey. Um, <laughs> I've never been tempted to eat a donkey, but it, it, was, it, was a, but it was a useful creature. And so because they weren't going to eat it, they weren't going to sacrifice it, he says you have to redeem this thing too. Now, he says you're, you're not going to, he says you're going to break its neck if you refuse to, to redeem it. Now, obviously, that means if you, ref, if you have a donkey and you refuse, to, a firstborn donkey, and you, refer, you refuse to, uh, to redeem it, you, you lose it, basically. And the reason they break the neck was because they didn't want it to be confused with being a sacrifice, the way you would have killed another animal. So the idea here is that whether it's the donkey or whether it's the firstborn son, these things have to be redeemed. Their lives have to be purchased back through the sacrifice of a lamb. This is the and, and when that son asked the question at some point, why do we do this? Here's what you're supposed to say, God says. You tell them that the Lord had to kill Egypt's firstborn, both man and beast, but he spared Israel's firstborn as part of the redemption. And so as a result of that, we redeem the firstborn of Israel through this sacrifice, this act of consecration as a sign of what God did with his mighty hand. And this sign is supposed to be so tangible. This reality of God's redemption is supposed to be so real to you, so part of your identity, it would be as if it was stamped on your forehead and on your hand. We saw that repeated twice here. Now, later on in Israel's life, they will take this a little more literally. And you see the word phylactery there. And if some of you may remember uh, what a phylactery is, it literally was a little box that was kind of strapped in a headband around their head. And they would put some scripture in there and they would carry it around. And so it was a very obvious sign of what you were doing. It's a, it was a way of advertising, this is how important God's word is to me. I've got it strapped on my forehead. Now, here in chapter 13, it's not literally meant that you're supposed to do this. It just means God's redemptive act and your identity as a, as a redeemed people is supposed to be so important and so prevalent in your life that it's as if it was on your forehead and on your hand. So we see by this that the identity of, of Israel as a redeemed people, as someone who exists as a nation only because of God's activity, as God purchasing them, that that identity as redeemed is supposed to be so prevalent, it's on everything they do. It's on every moment. It's, it's in their every decision. It's in their daily walking, working, living out identity. I am a redeemed person. Now, again, to be redeemed does not mean how we often use it in our society. To be redeemed does not mean I came back from hard work, through, through hard work, through sacrifice, and through this defiant spirit. I came back and made myself better. I won this time. That's not redeemed. Redeemed here means I'm done. I'm out. And someone, in this case God, showed up, bought me, purchased me, did everything for me that I could not do. He rescued me and restored me. So now my identity is this. I was done. I was lost. I was over. I was defeated. I could not come back. But he, at great sacrifice, at great effort, gave of himself to buy me back. That's redeemed. And that truth should color and shape everything I am and everything I do from the moment it happens to the end. I stand before you this morning here, not because of hard work, not because I, uh, I had some effort that made me worth it, not because of anything I could ever possibly achieve. I stand before you this morning as someone who was restored and redeemed and purchased 
by the blood of Christ and for no other reason. That's what it means to be a redeemed people. And this is what God is trying to get across to Israel. You are a redeemed people. We are, we have been redeemed by God's, let me say it this way, in a sense, we have been redeemed by God's firstborn this morning. Now, the, the Bible calls Jesus God's only begotten son, and we understand that's a title. Jesus wasn't, Jesus wasn't birthed by God the Father in the same way we think about it. it. There was not a point when Jesus did not exist. He was The Son of God is eternal. He is God. So there wasn't, a mo- there wasn't a moment in time when the Son of God didn't exist. He's always existed. But it's a title. The, the Father and the Son relate to one another as a Father and Son, and there is a title, there's a position of, inf- of influence and importance. There's a role that the Son of God plays as a Redeemer that we call Him the Firstborn. Psalm 89 gives a hint of this. In the Messianic Psalm, God says, in the short term of David, but really ultimately of Christ, I shall make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So that's already indicating that he's already there, and I'm going to give him this title. Colossians chapter 1, in this hymn to Christ, it says this of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It doesn't mean that he's the first item that was created it just means he has this title of being over and more important and the first of of everything he is before all things and in him all things hold together he's the head of the body the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything we see there the purpose romans 8 29 everybody knows romans 8 28 but romans 8 29 says this for those whom god foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he, the Son, would become the firstborn among many brethren. Revelation 1, 5, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. The, the title of firstborn has been given to Christ, not because he was physically born in the way that you and I were, he's eternal, but because he has this position of preeminence. Understand, in that ancient culture, to be the firstborn son meant that you were the heir. You were a, in a position of authority. It's a title that was given. And sometimes to the person who wasn't actually the firstborn male child. You remember the story of Jacob and Esau, right? Esau is literally the firstborn, but Jacob bears the title of firstborn. Even go back further than that. Go back to Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael. You know who is literally the, Abraham's firstborn son? It's Ishmael. But who has the title of firstborn? Isaac. So Jesus is given the title as the Son of God is firstborn. And guess who was given to us for our redemption? The firstborn of God. Just like it was the firstborn of Israel, just like it was the firstborn of Egypt. There is redemption here, and we have been bought, we have been bought by the blood of the Lamb who John accurately called the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God, Christ is our Redeemer. And all those who trust in Christ have been bought with a price. So what do we do in response? Or whatever we do, eating or drinking or whatever we live our life, if you are redeemed, you live for the glory of God. You, through your life, reflect the redemptive person that you are. A thousand years or more, more than a thousand years after the events of Exodus 13, Jesus would sit down with his 12 closest followers and he would add another layer to the meaning of Passover, extending it beyond the people of Israel themselves to all those who who would be redeemed by his own sacrifice and act on the cross. Just as Passover is at once a single event and a remembrance of that event, So what we call the Lord's Supper was a singular event 2,000 years ago, Christ on the cross, and a continuing reminder of that event. The Lord's Supper is a continual, regular part of the Christian's life to remind us that you and I are, this morning, as we take this moment in just a few moments, we are a redeemed people. That's our identity. We are a people who are here 
not from any effort of our own, not of any self-determination, not of any righteousness that we might bear, not of any hard work we put in, but we are redeemed because God redeemed us. He purchased us. He bought us, and we belong to Him. 1 Corinthians tells us in chapter 6, don't you know that you are not your own, but you have been bought with a price? As a people this morning, if we are in fact followers of Christ, we are a redeemed people, not belonging to ourselves, not rescuing ourselves, not saving ourselves, but having those things done for us. And whether we are interacting with one another or our neighbors across the street, our family members, those that we work with, or those who experienced tornadoes this week in Little Rock or elsewhere, we relate to them as those who are in fact redeemed, purchased, and bought. And that is our continual identity. Is Abraham devoted Isaac only to see God rescue Isaac and redeem him through a lamb? As Israel, God's firstborn, as he called him in Exodus, would be redeemed with the firstborn of Egypt and even the blood of a lamb and even their own firstborn to a degree, so does God even today redeem us with his own blood as Boaz did for Ruth. As the Passover was remembered and observed for Israel, so this morning is our redemption remembered by the cup and by the bread. Now, as we prepare this morning for the supper, we remember from last week as we talked about Passover, that the Passover was for Israel and for Israel alone. In fact, God repeatedly told Israel a couple times in chapters 11 and 12 that it was only for the Israelites, that no outsiders were allowed to, to take part in the observance. And the truth is, even the Lord's Supper this morning is, in fact, only for those who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. It is not my desire to make anyone feel left out or anyone to feel excluded, but the truth is this. The supper we're about to participate in this morning is only for those who have been redeemed. In 1 Corinthians, Paul, speaking to the Corinthian church, details how they have, in fact, been abusive in their use of the Lord's Supper and weren't paying attention to things like that and that there were some consequences as a result of that. So this morning, I, let me remind you, as we get prepared to take the Passover, that God does as he gave Israel a long list of things to do in properly observing the Passover, God has, in fact, given us this morning a handful of instructions to do this. And one is this. We are to be a bought and, and purchased, redeemed people in order to do this. So if you have never placed your faith in Christ, if this morning you would be honest enough to say, I have never given my life to Christ, I have never repented, I've never given him my Lord, I've given him my faith, I'm not really his, let me be let me be careful. Let me, let, me, let me share with you this morning. This is not for you. And I, I don't mean that to be mean. But this is for those who are redeemed. It's for those who have identified with him. And I, I would suggest this morning that it's for those who have redeemed, those who have followed Christ and identified with him through baptism. These are not new things. We just don't always talk about them. But I, I feel in the wake of Passover, the discussion of all that God told them, that's who, the, that's who this is for. So, this meal we're about to participate in, if you are this morning a believer, redeemed person of Christ, you've been baptized. This is for you. Because we this morning gather together as a redeemed people around the table of our Redeemer. But God also says to us in 1 Corinthians 11 that even God's own redeemed people should make sure and stop and prepare themselves for the table. He tells them in 1 Corinthians 11 to take some time to reflect, to meditate, to confess, and to repent, to make sure you are ready to come to the table of the Holy One who has redeemed us. He says that there's even some people in 1 Corinthians, in that Corinthian church, who, who are believers who have been taking the supper in the wrong way. So we're going to take some moment, we're going to take a moment this morning to do exactly that. Would you, with me, bow your heads and close your eyes, and if it is your, and I would invite you to take the supper this morning if you are indeed a believer and the Lord. But before we take the supper, would you ask the Lord to reveal to you any 
undealt with sin. And as God points those things out to you, would you confess your, would, would you repent before him this morning and ask his, ask him to restore to you a right heart? Heavenly Father, this morning as we partake in these things that Jesus talked about so long ago, when he took the bread and the cup of Passover and applied it to what he was about to do and gave it to the disciples and then to us the way you gave Passover to Israel to remind them of the cost and their identity as a redeemed people. Father, we pray that you would do these things in us today. Lord, would we, would you make us right before you give us a heart of repentance and a heart of, of submission before you this morning so that we as your people can take this in such a way that we proclaim the works of Christ and our identity as a redeemed people. Lord, may you be honored this morning as we remember. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For those of you who are helping serve our meal this morning, come forward. The night of Jesus' crucifixion, or the night before his crucifixion, as they were in fact celebrating the Passover, those, Jesus gathered those guys around the table And he took the bread and said, this is my body. In other words, I'm the lamb, he said. And as that lamb would give its body for Israel in, in Exodus, as the lamb gave its body for Isaac, as it gave its body for the firstborn of Israel that they might be redeemed, this is my body given for you. Maxie, would you lead us in a word of prayer and a blessing over the bread?
the night before his crucifixion, our Lord took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. After he'd taken the, the bread that night, he took the cup. Obviously, there is a, a look for the contents to mimic the blood of Christ given for us, the blood of the Lamb. Gary, would you lead us in a word of prayer over the blessing over the cup? Jesus took the cup and said, this is my blood given for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. I don't know where you're at this morning, but we wouldn't want to leave without giving you if you have never come to faith in Christ. If perhaps this morning you, in hearing all this and seeing this, display through the supper have realized that you as of yet have not been redeemed because you've never repented and placed your faith in Christ. But this morning you've realized as we approach a very special Sunday next week as we commemorate the resurrection of Christ that you have never placed your faith in him. You've never come to him but you're still not necessarily redeemed. But you want to be. You want eternal life. You want that relationship with your Redeemer. I want to invite you this morning to do that, do exactly that. We're going to stand and Craig's going to lead us in a, a time of worship.
And if you've never accepted Christ or want to know more about that, I would encourage you to, we'll talk right now, at least begin the conversation. Alan will be in the back. You can talk with him. Or at the very least, look us up immediately after the worship service. I can think of no better way to start the week before Easter than talk with you about what it means to be redeemed. Let's sing. Just a couple of quick notes this morning uh, before we are dismissed. Of course, you know, this week is the week before Easter. Uh, Wednesday night, we've got our normal programming going on. Uh, children are meeting, youth are meeting. We will have a, a Bible study here, but it will be a little different this coming Sunday or this coming Wednesday night. We will do something called a tenebrae or a service of shadows. And this is a way of remembering in particular uh, the night before Christ's crucifixion. And also just remembering of the cost of our redemption. So when you come in Wednesday night, it'll look different. It'll be dark. And it'll be, uh, I think, a special time of worship for us on, Sunday, on Wednesday night. So that's, the times are the same as they always are. But I would invite you to that Wednesday night. Friday, as Alan mentioned before, we are hoping to have 12 hours of continuous prayer as a church. Now, I know we have been praying for three weeks up to this point for those that we know are not saved. But you cannot have too much prayer. And uh, as we go into a resurrection weekend, Easter weekend, uh, I, would, I think it would be fantastic for us if at all possible to have 12 straight hours from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. of continual prayer. 30-minute time slots. I know several of them are filled up, but we still have a few available. If you have not signed up for a prayer slot, it's, uh, it's right there by the office. Please don't walk away this morning without taking a look at that and signing up. The prayer room will be set up here. The building will be open. Uh, all day long on Friday for prayer. And uh, so you'll be given some resources to help you through that 30 minutes of prayer, and I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Saturday morning, 11 o'clock, we'll have our extravaganza. Um, I think right now the forecast looks pretty pretty good. So last year we got rained out. Uh, we'll be setting up at least by 10 o'clock. If you can help us set up, we'll be starting that set up at 10. We have bounce houses and games and food and all those types of things going on that morning if you can please come to that don't bring somebody with you if you don't think you can actually help out physically with maybe setting something up or whatever that's okay we need folks who will just show up and hang out with our folks here in, in london uh, we need conversationalists you may be going i don't know about that yeah it's all right it's just they're just neighbors grab a hot dog and have a conversation with someone let them know god loves them and if nothing else invite them the next sunday morning or the next day next sunday just a couple of quick notes here. We will have a, we will have a sunrise service at 6.45. We had, I think I put the wrong time in last week, but it's 6.45, Sunday morning. Next week we'll have a sunrise service right out here in the backyard, okay? We'll get to see the sunrise come up. So 6.45 a.m., 
it's a, if you, I don't want to be dressed up at 645, it's okay. People wear jeans, if people wear jeans here, it's fine. So just show up, the chairs will be out there, everything else will be normal. We'll have, we'll have, cool, we'll have Bible studies at 930, and we'll have a resurrection service at 1030 next Sunday morning. If you've been praying for someone the last three weeks, look for a way this week to bring them with you on Sunday morning. I guarantee you two things. They're going to hear the gospel, and they're going to get loved on. That's not a bad morning right there, all right? So I invite you to do that. Okay, all that's out of the way. We're going to read from 2 John 3 and be dismissed. 2 John verse 3 says this, Grace and mercy and peace be with you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, who is His in truth and in love. Amen. And we're dismissed.